It's seven o'clock, so I'd like to call the meeting to order. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the last meeting of the year. May it be our best. Maybe not. Uh, actually, <laughs> if, if you're feeling anything like me, it's, it may just be a, feel like a really long one. Um, so we will be efficient tonight. And Anne, since it is your last meeting, I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank you for all of your service and your feedback and uh, the many, many contributions you've made to the board. Thank you. Thank you. You've been a tremendous asset to the community as well, I might add. Thank you. All right, uh, public invited to be heard. Nicole, I believe you said there are none. Correct, there is none. Let's go ahead and move on to the minutes. Everybody uh, should have had an opportunity to review them. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? I motion to approve the minutes. What a way to go out, Anne, with the courageous <laughs> step, moving to approve the minutes. I like it. I like it. How about a second? Second. Graham, second. Any discussion, corrections to the minutes? Okay, then all in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Polly, it's okay. You, I saw you put your hand up, but you don't have to be afraid. Uh, you're not, <laughs> you will not be reprimanded. Okay. I mistakenly raised my hand just ignore me. You can raise your hand as much as you want. It still doesn't count. It still won't count it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. And Molly, I'll let you take it away with our next agenda item, which is the TRG recommendations for 2021 CBDG project funding. Great, thank you. Um, so we're first going to have a presentation from Boulder County, uh, the Boulder County Personal Finance uh, Counseling Program. They provide counseling services for the whole county, um, specifically for our programs, both uh, applicants to the Down Payment Assistance Program and the Rehabilitation Program meet with housing counselors for um, a budget review and a loan review if they're purchasing a home or if they are refinancing and are in one of our programs. Um, last year, the board approved um, setting, doing a set aside for the counseling program. Um, for this year, it's $50,000. And the board also um, decided they would like to hear more about the trends that the counseling program is seeing from their clients as opposed to um, how other applicants usually provide a, an overview of their the history of their organization and the services they provide. So we have Meredith and Darlene who are from the counseling program and I believe Meredith is going to um, give us a presentation with her PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. And Meredith, just a one moment. Uh, just so I'm clear, Molly, is there going to be an actionable item for the board or is this informational tonight? This is information only. So okay. you don't have to make any, um, take any action. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Meredith, to <laughs> have interrupted you. Go ahead. No, it's good to know what you're doing. That's no problem at all. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. So give me just a moment and um, I'll make sure I can let you guys see the uh, PowerPoint. All right, if someone would let me know if and when you can see it. We can see it. Okay, awesome. that's great. So uh, again, I am Meredith with the Personal Finance Program um, with Boulder County, and we have partnered with the City of Longmont in your CBDG grant um, for a few years now. So I appreciate you giving me the time to chat with you about um, what we're seeing, some of the trends and how we're kind of um, giving a service to the community. And um, I wanna start off by showing a little bit of what we're seeing over the last, <clears throat> excuse me, I think I went back five years. Um, so we work with folks, as Molly was saying, around housing topics, um, but in a holistic way. So we look at the whole financial picture. So. If you're looking at doing a rehabilitation or if you're looking to buy a home or if you're feeling insecure about making your next mortgage payment, 
we're the folks that you talk to. So uh, looking back at the last several years, when we work with folks under pre-purchase, so um, folks who are looking to buy the five-year average, that's about 10% of our clients and 9% um, of our specific city of Longmont clients. Um, and so that's, a, but yeah, that's a, about an average. It used to be a little bit higher, but then we saw a shift in folks who really needed to be categorized a little bit more of, I want to buy, but I'm not quite ready. So we focus on the overall financial picture. And again, that comes under financial management. So the majority of the clients that we see and have been seeing over the last five years um, are for things to get them ready for home ownership or just to um, make them more stable and sustainable in their rental um, status, I, you could say. So that would be credit improvement. We look at debt reduction and rental counseling and student loan management and, and goal setting. And we've started using a coaching model. So um, we start looking at, at someone's circumstance and what might um, help them by meeting them where they are. So it's not just saying, here's general advice, but what is your credit report? And what are steps that you would need to take? And so we're finding that um, we're also tracking results now and it's working really well to have folks have such an individualized approach. So that's the majority of how we approach the housing um, and the goal setting and the spinning plantation. Um, but we also do reverse mortgage counseling and um, then post-purchase. So that's kind of this general term, um, which is about how we talk about foreclosure intervention, or if you're feeling insecure about your next mortgage payment, or that can be about refinancing, which sometimes is a little bit more positive, um, and uh, rehabilitation loans and working with Molly and saying, hey, is this going to be affordable for this person? How are they going to make it work? Have they really uh, taken a deep dive into those numbers? And we get to do that with someone in a non-judgmental way. So traditionally, that is about 7% of what we see over the last five years. That's kind of the average. Um, but with foreclosures, we noticed that in 2017, they took a major dip and they were really down. Um, and then they started creeping up a little bit, people feeling a little insecure, maybe they overbought. Um, and then now we have this interesting and tough time with COVID where we're seeing that um, foreclosure scares are up a little bit. There are now about 10% of our appointments, um, which is between three and 6% up from um, previous years. So folks are starting to give us a call. And I wanna mention that um, we actually got six calls on Monday about foreclosure. Uh, so we're seeing the writing on the wall that people are starting to get nervous about that again. And I can, in the next slide, I'll speak to why that's going to be. Um, and then we've also picked up this year COVID response. So we're talking about mortgage navigation and how you make priority payments, how do you know what's a priority and um, how to communicate with creditors and what creditors are offering. And um, really the biggest thing when I was talking to my counselors and coaches about what they're seeing is people are nervous and they're they're stressed and they want to figure out a plan to survive this moment but that doesn't shoot them in the foot later that how can they thrive later um, and in our appointments again they're really really individualized and we work really hard to understand um, knowledge of the industry so um, most people are walking away and saying hey I feel like I have a little bit of hope I understand what I need to know about my debt I understand what I need to know to get my mortgage working again or how to refinance um, and hope was the biggest word that I, I read in our surveys as well. So we've had about 300, a, a little over 340 contacts since March um, that were COVID related of people having some financial insecurity. Um, so those are newer things that we're working on. Um, I'm not gonna read this whole list, but I wanted to address what people are experiencing. And a lot of this, you know, from general living in Boulder County and, you know, the high rent and, and that can sometimes lead to high debts. And we have a really well-educated population, but that also comes with high student loan debt um, and, and credit issues and all kinds of things. So over the years, we've seen the writing on the wall and we've seen people asking us, we need to know about how to navigate, how I can buy a house when I have such high student loan debt. So um, we uh, got everyone in our program certified in federal student loan debt and uh, navigating those options. So we spend a lot of time making sure that we can address that for folks. Um, and uh, we also, this Past, over the past two years have all gotten certified um, through HUD. There's a new exam we all had to pass, making sure that we can confidently advise people on their um, housing issues, their mortgages, their rental issues, and, and on the such. So um, we're seeing a lot of 
ways to answer some of these questions that the is having. But 2020 has really given us um, a lot to, to learn. Um, there's a lot of good, but there's also a lot of, of rough stuff. So job insecurity is up, and so we're having to make sure we understand how predators work and what they're offering and what's a scam and what's not. But then there are also really low interest rates. So we're seeing folks want to refinance, and we're seeing them want to um, take advantage of low low cost loans. That can be a car loan or getting a mortgage loan. So um, people are wanting to take on more debt because of the the low interest rates. Um, which brings us to another thing we're seeing, which is um, there are now tightened mortgage requirements. So if you imagine a, uh, a mortgage lender wants to uh, pay their investor, but they're not receiving payments from a lot of the, their borrowers because the borrowers can't make it. So then maybe they're in a, um, a forbearance, but they still have to pay their bills. On top of that, um, they're having to pay out escrow and other and other things. So, and then with the low interest rates, they're not making very much money right now. So they're tightening all of their requirements. You might need to have a higher credit score, a higher down payment, or um, a lower debt to income ratio in order to qualify for a loan right now. So we're making sure that we can prepare people for that. Um, and again, help them with each individual step they need to uh, have to get there. Um, there are several other things that we're seeing, mortgage retention options. Some of them are a little easier if you're mortgage qualified under the CARES Act. A lot of people didn't, but a lot of people did. Um, so there's some easier access to loan forbearance. Um, and then a big change we saw this year is how people access our service. There are a lot of community organizations that refer to us to help folks have a sustainable plan. One of those is the Hour Center. Um, we partner really heavily with them. And if they do rental assistance, they uh, require that um, their participants have a personal finance coaching appointment so we can help um, kind of attack the root cause. So, you know, I can't make my rent. Well, what kind of debts are you paying? Can we help you figure those out? You know, are student loans an issue? Or um, is there just a chronic issue of not having enough money? And how do we go ahead and address that now? Um, how's that going to play into your housing in the future? And this year, because of so many people having um, job insecurity and so much rental assistance, they stopped that requirement. So we actually saw less clients from the Hour Center and some of our other community organizations this year, not because they didn't think it was important or that we don't think it's important, but we also realized there was a lot going on and we don't want to require people to have one extra step if it's just not going to fit into their capacity at that moment. Um, and we have a couple concerns for 2021. In the next slide, I'll show a little bit more, but basically these COVID forbearances will be ending um, because they're only for 12 months. So people will most likely be experiencing some mortgage insecurity. Um, also foreclosure and eviction memorandums, they're scheduled to end, it's scheduled to end on January 1, but can it be extended till February 1? When those end, people's protections are lost. And so we will see um, some housing issues come up. Um, and Another issue that has arisen that most people don't realize is that if you're not paying your mortgage, you're not paying your escrow, which is your insurance and your taxes. Um, and we all get that letter if we own a home once a year that says, oh, we're adjusting your escrow to make sure you're um, paying the right amount. People will likely see maybe even several hundred dollars worth, um, uh, of, excuse me, a hundred dollars or, or a couple hundred dollars of their payment go up. So we might see a significant increase in people's um, mortgage payments, which I think could cause some housing insecurity as well. So 2020 has brought a lot of new things. We, we felt pretty comfortable seeing the trends like you know, foreclosures were low, and then now we're, we're seeing a little bit of an uptick in those. And pre-purchase counseling was high and it went down and now it's up again. Um, so we've been on a bit of a, of a roller coaster from what was somewhat steady. Um, and the last slide I want to show you, well, excuse me, not the last slide. The one reason I wanted to show this slide was just to let you guys know that we are always evaluating our approach and how to be um, approaching our community and having our community access our services. And obviously we switch everything to virtual and phone right now. Um, and where I mentioned the coaching model and that we're collecting a lot of data from our clients. But the biggest thing this year that we've changed um, is our racial equity lens. That's one of the largest things that uh, we've taken on by looking at who is accessing our services, how they're accessing them. And we're do, we've done a lot of research into the history of mortgages and the history of race in housing and how that really plays into 
what should be fair housing today and how we can um, really lean on fair housing laws to protect folks that maybe don't even realize that there is a level of discrimination um, because it's always been the norm. So that's a lens that we're really looking at uh, that we think is really important. Uh, and I'm more than happy to speak more to that, um, but I do want to respect your time. So the last slide here, I do want to talk about our funding and client numbers. So looking back at the last five years at how many clients we are serving, you can see that we started out per year in 2016 as less than 500 a year. And then we peaked last year at over a thousand um, families that we served. And the residents of the city of Longmont are almost consistently always around 30%, which makes sense since we serve the whole county. Um, and so your residents are a little bit higher um, as of November of this year. Our goal for this year was uh, knowing we had lower numbers was to hit um, 200 Longmont resident clients. Um, and as of November 30th, when I pulled these numbers, uh, we were at 183. So I'm not entirely sure how December looks. I think we'll be close. Um, but funding I want to speak to because I think it directly reflects some of these numbers and these numbers directly reflect the funding. So in 2019, we had to give back about $3,000 of the $50,000 uh, CBDG grant that we got from the city of Longmont. And um, that was because of an administrative error on my part, which is really embarrassing to admit, but I took the job in October and um, was transitioning from the previous person and I misunderstood how um, we were documenting certain funds. And at the end of the day, it meant that we had returned $3,000. Um, and again, but don't take that lightly. So you think, okay, 2020, I've got it right. I've got it all together. And then uh, the pandemic hits and we have less clients and the CBDG funds, which I know you're all very aware of are tied um, to clients. So even though we've been very busy this year doing research and making sure we understand how all of these industries are changing and how to do accurate um, advising to folks, we don't necessarily have all the, as many clients as we normally have that we can build that to, to say it was for this particular person's situation. So while we had to, had to do a lot more research, we can't directly build some of that. So we have yet to see exactly how much we will be spending through the end of December. So um, that's a little bit up in the air and we'll get to it, but I, I know that our numbers are down this year because of the pandemic and not seeing as many direct clients. Um, and then 2021, we are predicting a, a pretty heavy year. Um, and I think folks will be resilient, but they're gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of learning curve. Um, there's gonna be mortgage insecurity as deferments. And I think pre-purchase counseling will go up as folks continue to want to buy with these low interest rates. And then uh, student loan changes have started to happen. And then under the Biden administration, there are other loan changes that are predicted. And so we are doing our best to be up to date with that as we get a lot of calls from folks about how to navigate the very confusing student loan world. And then um, our community partners, such as our center, EFA, um, and others who lean on us to help with, um, help navigate the clients who have housing insecurity and do financial coaching. Um, they have spoken about having to want to, um, excuse me, having us do their financial counseling as a requirement again. So we anticipate those numbers to be up well. So I just spoke you off for several minutes, but I do want to end with the fact that we love serving the clients in Boulder County and specifically in Longmont, that it's a, a privilege um, to do that. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. And I'm going to close out my presentation and stop sharing. As soon as Great, I can figure out how to do that. Thank you, Meredith. Okay. Darlene, is there anything you wanted to add to any of this before we? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, the, the thing that we wanted to stress the most was just that, you know, because of the pandemic, we have certainly seen a decline um, in terms of the number of referrals. And I think that, that a lot of that just has to do with folks being in a state of crisis and, you know, financial coaching is not necessarily on the top top of their mind um, in terms of, you know, what they need to do. So we anticipate, though, that we're going to definitely see a spike um, after the first of the year and um, certainly ready and able uh, to serve, serve the community. So great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, one question that I have is um, what's what's the best your ideal takeaway 
for us? What, what would you most want for us to take away from this information and, and how can we be most helpful to you? That's a, I think that's a great question. I think um, knowing that this service A exists and um, talking about housing insecurity or financial insecurity or even food insecurity, whatever it may be, folks are really struggling right now. And it's not maybe the folks that we always traditionally think it is of just someone who's low income. A lot of people can be um, concerned or insecure about their financial situation. And so this service is out there for everybody. And we are super um, happy to be offering it and hope that if you know of anyone that um, might want a little bit of assistance in navigating some of these really tricky worlds, we're here not just for the folks that you might traditionally think of, but for you, for your neighbor, for your family. Um, and it's a non-judgmental environment and way to, way to get some assistance out there. Great, thank you. It's really an impressive range of services that you're offering. Thank you so much. We're happy for your assistance to help make it happen, to be quite honest. Are there any questions from board members or staff? No. So, I, I, quick question, Meredith. Um, so, I, um, I know it's been some time. Um, so, my understanding, though, because I, I see the you're still getting home study clients, though, right? From the R Center, we still do get quite a bit of, okay. of, yes, of clients from the R Center. There's they have a particular um, mental assistance program that they still ask folks and they have a heavy suggestion that folks um, come and take advantage of the service. Okay, all right. Absolutely. And so two clarifying questions I have. One is you mentioned billing, uh, that you had a reduction in, in billing, I think you said. Who are you billing? Is it uh, agencies or, I, I wasn't clear on that. Great question. So we, um, get a grant from the CBDG grant from the city of Longmont. We also have a few other grants that um, we administer and they, every time we meet with a client, we are billing every minute of our time to a particular grant, including what we call the city of Longmont grant, um, because we account for everything we're doing and how that relates to an individual or a family. Um, and there are, of course, requirements for what you can bill and what you can't. And so, um, the city of Longmont grant in particular is very client focused, not so much the um, research or research or training part of it, but how you're actually working with that client. So we, um, we can build certain things and time to that grant or to this other grant. So that's what it means. We, we bill our time essentially. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. That's really that's helpful. How we, so yeah, that's how we spend down the grants. So. We, we should also take away that the fact that you're billing less right now is a temporary situation because of COVID and does not necessarily reflect on future demand. Yes, um, um, I appreciate you clarifying that. Maybe I should have said that myself. Uh, looking at back at the last five years, you can see that we've increased our scope of services and therefore we have a wider range of clients um, and a lot more clients. In addition to that, we've partnered with more community organizations. So, um, you know, the Our Centers and EFAs, um, as well as domestic violence shelters, or we um, partner with particular, um, um, I lost my train of thought, um, homeless shelters and, and things like that of, of folks who might need our services or senior centers and um, they refer clients. And so as we've widened our scope of what we can offer, our clientele has um, widened as well. And so generally we see an uptick in how many people we meet in the, this year has just been a tough year for everybody. Yeah, yeah, great, thank you. Uh, and I'd forgotten what my other question was. I think it was brilliant. So um, we'll just have to assume that it was. Um, so uh, any other questions? No. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you so much for taking the time to present this information to us. And I, I wasn't aware of it, so it's very helpful. And um, I can only imagine you will unfortunately have a great deal of demand next year um as these pro as this support network of support that we've had this year really diminishes 
we anticipate that. Thank you so much for letting us have the time. It's always a pleasure to uh, let people know about our services and thanks for all you guys do. Great, thank you. Thank you. Have, have a wonderful great evening. evening. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, wonderful. So Molly, we're on, are you gonna take item B as well? I am. So the next item is for you all to review and take action on the TRG's uh, recommendation for funding for the Imagine application that they submitted. This was a CDBG application. Um, their initial request was for 66,000 to do re rehabilitation work on their Charles family smart home in Longmont. And so the TRG met with you all when Imagine presented and then they met separately to discuss the application and their recommendation is a grant, a CDBG grant for $34,000 to repair the two resident bathrooms. Um, that's shoring up the floors, uh, I think making some replacements um, and their, their discussion centered around the fact that they believe Imagine is fairly well funded, as well as wanting to make sure that Imagine was also contributing to the, the rehabilitation work of the home. And so um, they um, had some follow-up questions for Imagine, um, wanting to know about their reserves, what their future reserves are. Um, as well as if Imagine were to come in for future funding, that they be able to present a capital improvement plan for all of their homes in Longmont. Um, I have talked briefly with Imagine about them potentially coming in in the future to purchase single family homes, which would be a companion model where there's a Imagine companion who lives there and then two Imagine residents. So the TRG really wants to make sure that they're in a strong position to maintain those homes as well as their current one um, into the future. So, yeah, great. so the, the recommendation from the TRG is to approve the funding request from Imagine. For 34,000. For 34,000. So half of what, half of what Imagine is asking for. Got it. Um, Thank you. And they want it specifically to go to the bathrooms so that we are it, you're just, it's easier to track <laughs> if you know exactly what that, that money is going to be used for. Okay. Uh, any questions for Molly? Uh, Mo Molly, excuse me. Um, I, I guess I'm curious what the net effect is on CBD funding from a big picture. Um, uh, whether or not the 30, the 30 some odd dollars are approved versus the full. Is, is there a big picture impact there you could fill us in on? So for this fund, this latest funding round that they applied under, we had said uh, $345,000 was available. So um, they were the only applicant. So um, we will be going out for um, other funding applications at, in the first quarter of next year. Um, so there is still funding available. Um, so does, does that funding, is it use it or lose it, or does it roll over into the subsequent years or? Um... Um, it rolls over. It rolls so, over. Okay. So you don't, you don't lose it the, if it's not spent or allocated mm -hmm. right away. And I have also talked with um, Cinnamon Park, which received an affordable housing loan um, last year in 2019 for their construction of uh, 26 uh, senior units. And due to the pandemic and um, a decrease in their tax credits, um, equity and increase in construction costs, they have asked about applying for additional city funding. So that's in very initial discussions. So they may be coming in potentially for CDBG grant or loan to help um, close that gap um, to help that project continue forward. Thank you. Caitlin, you had a question and then Karen, Roni. 
Um, yeah, I think my question was to, to piggyback a little bit off of Graham's around sort of the big picture and the rollover is um, where we have been. Um, my recollection, and I don't have it in front of me, is that we have had quite a bit of funding that has rolled over um, in pre from previous years, but I'm not 100% sure. Karen, maybe you remember, for some reason, something like 600,000 was in my head as something that had rolled over, but I'm not sure if I'm like picking that from somewhere else. Um. Karen Roney. Well, I don't know if I can answer that specifically in terms of the amount, but what I will add is that the, what we have to pay attention to as it relates to our CDBG dollars is that um, we do not have more than one and a half times our allocation in the treasury um, or we get dinged for that. So it's really about the timeliness of, of, the, um, of, the, of the spending. So, so we can, staff has done a great job of um, continuing to, to monitor that. So come like November 1st of each year, we have to make sure that we don't have um, you know, more than one and a half times our, um, our allocation in, in the treasury. So we, we do, it, it will roll over, but our focus is to continue to spend that so we, we, we stay below that. Um, it sounds a little bit like threshold. that's like a department budget that if you don't spend your budget, they, they are concerned that, about it and they're gonna reduce it the next time. And so they're I gonna- I think you don't need it. <laughs> so yeah. there are large, large cities that you know seem to, but it doesn't matter. So, but yeah, so that's what we really have to pay attention to is the timeliness of, of uh, of spending those of spending those dollars and we are you know and just a reminder we are going out um quarterly so you know we are releasing funding applications on a quarterly basis basis for cdbg affordable housing other funding right and karen did you have a nope. different i was no i just wanted to come make that comment um okay based on graham's uh graham's comment Thank you. And Caitlin? Yeah, I was going to say, I think one of the things that struck me, and this isn't really a question, but more of a comment. One of the things that struck me when um, Imagine was doing their presentation was around um, sort of the things that help bring in funds for them. Like they're, everything is fairly limited. So for example, like Medicaid funding cannot be used for capital improvements. Whereas things like CDDG funding are limited to capital improvements and are sort of very directed at that. And so I guess to me, it feels a little bit like, um, and they are providing something that is desperately needed and that not a lot of people are doing, like not a lot of organizations are doing. Um, and because it's such long-term care, it's sort of like, it's one of those things that I think like as a community, it can be easy to forget that we need long-term care for adults with developmental um, disabilities. Like that, that those can't just like be institutions or just be families. Like those are things that are just long-term ongoing needs that aren't necessarily like flashy um, or like the, you know, the current thing that people are concerned about, but those people are in our community and making sure that they have safe and secure housing is something that as a community, like that's something that I feel like really strongly about supporting. And so I guess I'm looking at the, like not helping with like the flooring and it's like, that's a fairly, like it's a fairly small drop in the bucket for the funding we have. And it seems like, like the explanation there seemed very like, legitimate of like when you've got wheelchairs and you've got eight to 10 people moving through some of these common spaces day to day, like, I guess I'm like, not quite sure why we wouldn't fund something like that just because they might have another source of funding that sort of feels like, oh, we don't want, like, I'm not sure there. So, I, I had a similar question. Uh, Molly, could you speak maybe to uh, more specifically to the rationale for approving the bathrooms and not the rest. Is there a belief that the funding is basically there's opportunity cost to funding the floors 
for instance, if they could be funded somewhere else because the CBD funds could be used somewhere else or, or do you know? Um, no, it was, it was more um, along the lines of, they felt like the bathrooms obviously were a very important part um, of the repair work to be done. And that it was their thinking that provide half of the, the request and the bathroom costs come to 34,000. Okay. okay. So it seemed that that could just be allocated towards. Are you, I'm sorry, are you aware of the rationale for half of the request? Is that a financial concern or just? Um, there was a lot of discussion about Imagine's overall finances and that they do do a lot of fundraising. They bring in a lot of revenue. Um, so some hesitation in funding the whole, the whole project. Mm. Um, they also didn't believe that the furnaces should have to be repaired or replaced um, after only 10 years. Um, so there was uncertainty as to why that would, those two repairs would need to happen. Mm. Interesting. Graham? Uh, I'm curious if, you know, if we funded the full amount, would due diligence require um, that you receive receipts to confirm the money was spent for the, the grant request or the funding request? Or is it just like, here's like an insurance payment, like here's money for what you requested and then we're not going to follow up? What? No, they would have to turn in everything. So we would reimburse them based on um, the documentation that they've provided um, showing the work was done. Okay. Mm -hmm. Karen, do you, are there any other staff positions on this that the board should consider? Um, I guess the comment that I would make, um, and I certainly wasn't part of the, the, the conversations, I think um, particularly when, it, when we have received requests from entities that are, that own um, and operate buildings, the, the things that we wanna make sure that they are doing is that they have um, a capital replacement, you know, preventive maintenance capital replacement plan um, because, you know, to keep coming back every so often to CDBG or, um, or other sources to, mm. to fund maintenance for which that entity should be responsible for um, planning for, I, I think is, is, is probably a, a, a major issue. And I imagine, um, you know, Molly, that's a lot of what the TRG, you know, talked about. So, so again, I think just looking at uh, kind of balancing between the need what is, um, you know, what is the organization's responsibility to, uh, to plan and fund and to an ongoing capital uh, maintenance and replacement program? Um, yeah. And again, I didn't see their financials, but also what is their capacity to be able to fundraise for that? So it sounds like if I'm, um, if I'm understanding kind of what Molly's saying is that, yeah, we think that the city should invest some dollars in here um, that can help leverage the, um, other things that we think that they might be able to raise. And it seemed like there's a question about, is it a little premature to, um, to be replacing the furnaces? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know whether that is correct or not. So, um, so I think probably most of it is about um, sharing that responsibility and making sure they have a, a capital maintenance. Yeah, okay. In place. Th that's helpful, thank you. I, for myself, I'm like when it comes to should the furnaces be replaced or not, I, I'm hesitant to take a position on that kind of thing. I'm not a furnace expert, and um, I have to believe that there's good faith in the information that's presented to the board. Um, and the the idea of routine maintenance should be handled as a part of a ongoing fiscally responsible plan. I think makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, you, yeah, that, that just makes sense. So uh, are there any other questions for clarification or more information from the board? Okay, so why don't, at this point, I think we can entertain a motion uh, and the motion could, we, we could do this a couple of different ways. 
Uh, if there's anybody who believes that the entire amount should be funded, there could be a motion to that that could be entertained. Uh, if somebody wants to make a motion to approve the recommendation as made by TRG, that motion can be made and um, voting will carry the day in terms of what the outcome is. Caitlin? Um, I'd like to move that we approve funding for everything other than the furnaces. Snap, Caitlin, you came up with a totally different. <laughs> I'll um, second that. Okay. Karen? So, Molly, are you calculating how much that is? I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, I, I think the 59, I think it comes to 59. Because it's 66 and they have 7,000 estimated for the furnaces. Yep. I, and I, I think the exact amount may not be uh, exactly necessary because staff knows what the exact amount is. I mean, we're approving those items. Um, I but think it's happy... helpful to, to have it in the motion. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is 59. Okay, great. Okay, so there is a motion on the table that's been seconded to fund the imagined request to the tune of 59,000 for the floor and the bathrooms. Any further discussion on the motion? Um, I would, I, I really take the concern of planning seriously that that, that is a, you know, routine maintenance should be routine and not require necessarily kind of um, unanticipated outside funding, unless this is part of their routine planning, this kind of ask. Um, so I think it would be, if the motion is approved, I would ask that there's communication with Imagine about this specific issue and that this will be an item that's highlighted in future requests, at least for consideration from the board. Oh, God, that was a long sentence, and I don't know that it made much sense, but um, why don't we go ahead and take a vote if there's no other discussion. So all in favor of the motion to approve funding uh, at the amount of 59000 for Imagine, the Imagine project to cover floors and bathrooms, please say aye if you approve or raise your hand. Okay. Any opposed, please say nay. And any abstentions? Okay. The ayes have it. I show it passing unanimously, right, Chair? Yes, that is correct, Nicole. Thank you. Yeah, just wanted to make I did not raise my hand. I, I was still kind of on the fence. I was like, it kind of, I got a twitch in my elbow, but it never really manifested into anything. Um, uh, because I also want to be sensitive to TRG's work and their expertise and the time that they spend and acknowledge that that's respected. Um, and I think it was just a different a viewpoint in terms of risk and benefit. Okay. Thank you so much, Molly. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's move on to agenda item five, the 2021 Human Service Agency Funding Matrix brought to you by Eliberto. Hello. All right, well, I, I wanna thank um, Caitlin for helping me think through this. We had a pretty long discussion last Thursday, I think, just thinking in, in it's, it's a complicated, 
reality. So I'm going to share my screen. I, I updated the PowerPoint presentation that I did last meeting in November. I did remove the priority because that's not the, the, the individual. I can bring them back, but the individual limits were approved. That's all fine. It's really on the application formula. So that, that's really what this PowerPoint has. I'm going to go over the the first one I did again quickly, and then I'm going to jump to the other option that Caitlin and I worked out together. And then we're going to have a conversation about trade-offs and the differences between them. And I mean, ultimately it's the choice of the board. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Let's see if this works. All right. So, as a reminder, uh, okay, I got this here. Can everybody see that? I'm assuming. Okay. So option one, we it, as, as a reminder, it well, minimize this because I so I won't be able to see you all because in order for me to see the actual, I have to minimize everybody. So just speak up if you want me to stop. Um, you know. The, the option one that we created, we had changed the weights from the questions that the board and staff answered. We removed those weights and made it all straight. They're all worth what they're worth. And so, and we shifted how the weights points were awarded to the agency in the past. We did it by activity. And now we're in, in this option, we're doing it by just the area, right? And we had shifted, we had created a new, um, um, schema for the areas. So housing somebody who was number one got the most points at 35 and it went down by five that way. Um, so that was the, that was the changes that we did. And then this is what we got. It showed, it shows you the, the, the scores, the, the, the new ranges for housing stability. As you can see, it, it went down, but we didn't have as many points, uh, because of removing the weights from the board and staff questions. Um, and then it goes down from there depending on how many weighted points they get for priority area. You can see that it, it, on both sides, it goes down and that's because these get less points. So I'm gonna go through these real quick. All right, so this is option two, uh, this is what Kayla and I worked on last week and I, and I finalized earlier this week. This option is based basically on two factors. Um, one is the prioritization, prioritization and weighting has happened in how we approve, how we, we assess the priority areas. So for example, we, we gave housing stability 25% of the funding, right? So that's where their prioritization has happened. So we don't necessarily have to do it in the weights. Um, we we did it. We've done it. We've done it in how we we allocated a certain amount of funding to each area, um, and that, and that has some that has some implications that we'll talk about in a second. Then the other thing, the other factor is that in the way that we in option one, while we honor the priority areas, we don't pay a whole bunch of attention to the activities other than we want to see that there's are happening. In this option, we're actually giving extra points if an agency is in the is is serving a priority area and is also um, uh, doing an activity that we have prioritized or that the human service needs assessment has identified as a need activity, a needed activity in the community. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. And I can bring up the the in a second when I get done. I can bring up the the actual spreadsheet if you all wanna see it too. So just letting you know. So it's one slide because it does simplify it. So now we are not, you know, it's all about your scores. And these are the highest scores that any agency can get perfect. And I can tell you that, you know, this is, I chose these numbers arbitrarily again. I always put that caveat because really I, I just had to choose some numbers. Um, so a 95 is a perfect score. And so I, I, if you get an 87.5, the way that works to get to 87.5 is that you get an average of four on each of the questions from the board 
a four or a four point. I forget exactly, but you get. I can do. I can go back and look. You get a certain amount for for each. You get an average amount for each question, in the in the evaluation. You are you are doing something in a priority, and you get an extra ten points if you are actually doing one of the activities that's listed in that priority. Okay, and then that gives you a total of ninety five. Um, so then we look at the percentage of requests. So at a hundred to get a hundred percent, you got to get an eighty seven point five. Um, and I think that's 4.5. Um, and then it goes down from there. Uh, I think it's 4.5, 4, and then 3.5. Um, totally arbitrary. We can change that. I'm, I just need to choose something to start from. Um, so that is the, the other options. Here's, here's a couple of things to think about. And I know Karen had, had looked at it too and has some, has some thoughts as well. Because we are now using the, where in, in the past, the priority limits were just a guide. In this method, because we are using those priority limits that 25% of funding, however those are broken down, it could mean, it could, doesn't mean it will, but it could mean that in areas where we tend to have lots of applicants asking for lots of funding, if we run out, unless that we've been able to, and that was one of our, one of the things that, that Kay and I talked about, unless we are able to take from another area that didn't that underspent, you technically could score enough to get funded and not receive funding if there was no funding available in that priority area, and we couldn't we couldn't take an underspent area and transfer transfer funds there. So the, that is something to think about as well, that, it's a, that it potentially can happen, doesn't mean it will. The only one that I would be concerned about in my short time with the city and, and looking at the numbers is education, because that tends to be one that gets heavily applied for. So, so yeah, that's my presentation and we can have a discussion. I can leave this up here, I can take it down. If, um, if I'll, I'll take it down and we can start talking. First of all, any questions or Caitlin, if you want to share anything as well, because you you really were instrumental in helping put that together. We we talked to this quite a bit. Can you put that last slide back up, Aliberto? Actually, um, yes, yes. I think one of the things that I was thinking about with this one is that um, that human services needs assessment identified sort of some really key activities that were needed by our community, and my thinking was that if you're not doing one of those activities, then you're not meeting one of those sort of like priorities of the city. And so like if funding you at hundred percent doesn't seem like the right thing to do, if you're not doing one of those things that we've identified as a, um, as like the core needs that our community needs, um, you know, like we shouldn't start with, like, with that. Like, whereas the ones that are doing the things that are like, really increasing housing stability like we really want those to float to the top um, where it's providing rental assistance or those really key things where the human services needs assessment identified big risks for people in in our community so um by by doing this and making sure that you're actually hitting not only one of these just like big buckets but one of those activities that was that was one of the goals there so, um, you know, my reaction is it's, so this looks good. I mean, any framework to me is a great just place to be. Um, the, I think it's really hard to know whether the distribution is the right one until we actually got all the numbers in and, and see what, how that results in funding distribution and reality. Um, so, I, I'm good with it as it is, knowing that we'll probably want to adjust it as we see some of these areas that seem to be out of balance with the original premise and, and we'll want to adjust some of those percentages. Does that make sense? It does. And I um, and I want to be careful because it, 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 you know, it, it feels like you, you could put so the idea behind doing these these formulas 
is to make it a formulaic process, right? Um, and thus, you know, it, it, it removes the, not, you can never remove the humanness because you all are scoring and you're all are humans. But once you put a formula, and I, and, and I say this, my experience with CSBG in the state, they had a formulaic process that didn't always agree with how it came out, but, but it was hard to argue because it's a formula. Yeah. Formulaic. So, so not that we can't change the formula. I don't, I don't want to say that. I just want us to be thoughtful about it, I guess is what I would yeah. say. Yeah. I mean, I think your point though, Brian, about the like adjusting the distribution makes sense. Cause like typically like I would rather than numbers, we like, I I've seen stuff like this where it's like the top 10% or the top 20% are in the, that like top tier and then then the middle 50 percent is in that middle tier and then the bottom you know 25 percent is and doing it by percentages rather than specific numbers the specific numbers give us a starting point but if we have you know nobody who hits a you know a 90 for example i mean i don't necessarily think we should say nobody gets funded at 100 percent right? right like we may want to adjust that down but still do it in a formulaic way so that we still use all of our funding um, and and distribute all of it rather than being like, ah, nobody gets it all. Nobody met the criteria, you know? Um, I mean, there's some like floor, right? Like if you, if we have a whole bunch of agencies that are not using money well, like we don't want to just like hand them city money to go spend um, inappropriately. But um, I don't think, I don't think we're in that position. Um, yeah. I, I agree with that rationale, Caitlin. I, I think from my standpoint, the uh, what's working well about the formula is that one, we have clear criteria that we're evaluating organizations against to the most objective extent possible, uh, which is happening. And two, it removes individual favoritism or emotional kind of content because we would all have to have that emotional content in order to move the needle on a you know, specific agency. Um, so that, that's working. And then I think the question of should the should, should it be like the threshold for 100% actually be an 80 instead of an 87, that seems to be to me more of a question of efficiency and dist distribution of funding. Um, and I'm sensitive to what you mentioned, Eliberto. We don't want to turn, we don't want to start, you know, like, well, I really did like that agency and they almost came in. So let's go ahead and drop that. And, and that's, I think, certainly something we want to avoid. Um, okay, so if there's no other feedback, which I'm going to interpret as acquiescence to some extent. Um, do you have what you need, Eliberto, or do you, are you? Karen has a question. Jesus, you got her oh, hand oh. up. What? Karen, please. <laughs> so, and maybe we just have to work with it. You know, I, again, I think that the what we are doing is we're evaluating on, along two dimensions. So we're evaluating, you know, are the agencies providing a serve the, the service in the area that's a priority of the city based on our needs assessment? And are they, are they providing the activities? So it's kind of what are they doing? And is the what lined up with our, our needs assessment? And then, and then what we are also evaluating is how well do they do it? So what are they doing? And how well do they that they do that? And so that's what we're really trying to you know to to, to work out. My um, you know my initial concern when I reviewed this was, you know, if you say okay, if if you're doing anything that's in the needs assessment, you know, regardless of <coughs> how important it was, you all get the same amount of points. You all get the same amount of points for the for the for what are you doing. And, and that did create some, you know, concern for me um, to, to the point that Eliberto talked about is that, that, that we have, we have moved things around I and mean, we had some guidelines in terms of the amount that we set aside. Um, 
which was which was weighted. But um, and and every year we we make we make some changes based on what we've spent and not spent. Um, and I'm just worried about doing that when we haven't had the um, Nicole. You want to let in Karen Phillips, and so. Um, so by, by just saying everyone gets to say, I, you know, part of me is like, we don't even need to add, add those 10 points that, you know, um, or maybe we only add the 10 points for the act, if they're at least doing one of the activities, because no one should be applying or we should have screened out um, any entity that is, um, that is applying for something that's not in one of those overall buckets. So, right. um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's science and art and, um, you know, we, we could certainly try a different, you know, a different approach, but the waiting, it, it does matter. It, it means something. It means that it is um, not everything was the highest priority. There was a range of mm -hmm. priorities. And so I'm just a little worried about if ever you get the same amount of points, regardless of what priority you're meeting, where that might lead us. But, you know, I don't, I don't know. But so, I appreciate the simplicity around that. Um, but I, I, I'm just a little worried about um, not everything was weighted equal. You know, there are the yeah. priorities, but not every priority in the assessment was uh, at the same level of importance. And Karen, I, I, I think that's important. <laughs> and it choked you up. <laughs> it shook me up here. It was a hard one for Eliberto to talk about, so let's create a safe space for him. You and can't even I, say it. <laughs> the one safeguard that we do have, though, is so is those individual agency limits to that because they they do go down through the priority. Um, so that is a safeguard to to the. You know, yes, you might get the same points, but you know what? You can't get the same amount of funding because your limit is lower. Right. To, to so there are lower. checks and balances in terms of the weighting. I do so. Yeah, in both of them. So I, I think the weighting, like one of the things I run up against when I think through it is that if we essentially have, I think, seven questions per application that we're rating. And you have eight, we have seven. Oh, right, because the two at the end. Okay, so eight questions. And there is the presumption that each question is as important as the next. Uh, and I think if the questions are well phrased, you could argue that that, you know, you could make it that case that that would be true. Um, I, I haven't found, I have actually, the evaluations, I really appreciate the alignment between the, the evaluation and the questions asked on the application. I think that's been going much better for me at least this year because of that. Um, and I haven't seen any specific questions where I felt like, man, this is the question. Like if, if that, you know, if they're not doing well on this, they should just be, you know, go to the bottom of the stack. Uh, so it seems to me to be pretty even. Um, and it does seem like the priority, the amount of funding we put, we prioritize the buckets by their funding levels. Um, yeah, but pri prioritization is just such a, it's such a handy little flexible tool, right? That you can kind of say, well, we're going to turn this one up to 10 this year and that one down to five um, without really modifying the structure too much. But I guess the, the question ultimately, because a lot of this is academic until we know if it's created material changes in funding. It'll definitely, the prioritization will create, and I'll give you a, a clear example. Um, Self-sufficiency has gone up 
And last year, the only agency that was that was hit a ceiling was a self-sufficiency agency where education, I think, has gone down. I don't remember. I, I, and I think that there will be more agencies hitting that ceiling because they're in all terms of the in terms of the high, the level of priority. Right. Yeah, self-sufficiency did go up between right. the buckets in the buckets. Yes. Well, yes. What that means is, is individual limits also went up. Right. So it makes sense to me that the prioritization changed that way because of the circumstances we're in. We've, you know, agreed that self-sufficiency is a high priority because it's more on the survival level. Um, the Eliberto, do you expect that the change, like not having the weighting like we did before, setting aside the funding allocation overall, would you expect that some agencies which previously had scored highly relevant to relative to another one now all of a sudden wouldn't be because the weighting system somehow gave it an advantage or put it at a disadvantage the other one i'm, I'm not seeing that myself but it's hard to know until the numbers actually kind of are run so there's two pieces to this one is you never know so one year, an agency may may answer the questions in ways that the board or the staff feel are more are, are excellent, right? And so they get a higher the score. The you know the weight piece does help, but ultimately it is the the scores that you all and that we do that are the foundation. Um, yeah. The, yeah, they help, but they're not they're not the they're not the one thing, right? It's, 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 it's almost a third, a third, and a third, but you, our thirds are, are and you, in fact, your third's a little bigger than our third and the staff third, right? And then, and then the, the smallest third is, is, is the, the weights. Uh, and that was the same last year too, right? Um, that has not changed. That The weights is, is always the smallest third, but it's still important because that, depending on the ranges, whether you, you do an activity or not can decide whether you get 50%, 75 or 100% of the funding, yeah. right? So they're still important, um, but the foundational bedrock of the score is your scores and our scores. So it seems to me that in years past, and since we started this formulaic approach, we've had the opportunity to review the data and kind of do a gut check. Like, yep, that's working. Or, wow, that's not the outcomes that I thought, you know, would have expected. Maybe it requires some finessing. Um, with having sensitivity to the fact that we don't want to manipulate the formulas, but we want to make sure that limits and parameters are set in order to be a functional formula. That gut check seems to me will will answer a lot of these questions to look at the outcomes. I think the outcome that we're going to see is going to be like, yeah, actually, that pretty much reflects the feedback. I think it's going to work, frankly, whether there's the weighted in there or, or not, but I think we may need some fine tuning. Karen, were you going to say something? Yeah, I think, you know, I think if... Um... If the advisory board, you know, wants to go with the, um, you know, with the, the option that um, that Caitlin and Eliberto kind of worked out, I, I mean, I think we just you just give us that direction, and and that's the that's the matrix that we will use. And you know, if we, you know, it just seems like if we run into something really wild that we that we couldn't have anticipated. Then, then, then we have a fallback formula, you know, that we could certainly, um, that we could certainly, you know, apply. So yeah. we're really not going to know until we, until we plug in the scores and and see. But it seems like we have we have two viable options, and if we want to go with the um, option two, uh, which is the the new one that we talked about tonight, it really depends on what the board wants to do. We can just we we can do that and. And see where see where it takes us again. Again, we don't want to really be. Oh, I wanted that agency to get more. I think it really right. has to be look at what's the whole 
scheme um, and is, is something really, you know, skewed or do we get a, um, an, an unintended consequence that we just didn't anticipate? Yeah, I, that I think we, we just give it a shot. I, I completely agree with Karen. If we see that there's just way too many outliers on both sides and I think we, 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 we reevaluate the formula, but it's not based on individual agency. It'll be based on what the whole big picture of the scores are telling us. Caitlin? That's, yeah, that, I mean, that's kind of my thought too, is like tweaking it um, when we get in there. Cause like, if we, if the score, if we go in and the score is basically end up with us, you know, not, um, not funding something in like housing stability, which is our top priority that, you know, like if we end up, say, you know, nobody meets criteria for housing stability, but we've got all that money setting there, like, that that seems to be a pretty obvious case of like maybe the scoring is off in some way and so we need to look at that and it's less about like one agency didn't meet it and more that like holistically we aren't gonna do be able to meet the city's funding priorities for this in some mm. way um yep. so diana did you have something you were gonna say i, I wasn't certain okay I caught a motion over there out of the corner of my eye. I thought maybe it was your hand up. I was also going to add that, I mean, that that is part of the reason why we have people reviewing applications and going through this funding. Like we, we want it to be objective, right? But we also don't want it to just be a computer spits out what everybody gets funded and then that's it and nobody looks at it, <laughs> um, right? Like we don't just want that to be the case. Like there's a reason that we have a board that looks at these and tries to um, figure out the, the best way to allocate it. Um, yeah. And so like the directionality of it, I think is really helpful to help us remove like biases and make sure that we're actually getting a holistic view of an agency and what they're doing. But then like, we're a check on sort of just being like, oh, the, the, num the, the computer spit it out, you know, which is what like banks tell people. They're like, that's what they told me I could give your credit limit. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh no, somebody, somebody programmed that like, <laughs> um, yeah. So. so if we run this and Longmont Meals on Wheels ends up at the bottom of the stack, somehow we'll be like, wait, crunch the numbers again. Some something didn't quite work. You know, there's okay. So let's go with option two. Uh, I do like that it's simplified. I think that can help with accuracy and consistency and, and just kind of reconstruct uh, resetting things in future years. Um, and let's see what happens. We'll do a gut check and, and see if everything works out okay. And if not, then Caitlin and Eliberto are really to blame. I'm always to blame. That's all right. Uh, oh. I heard just real quickly, Brian. Um, and I and have someone to blame. <laughs> uh, I'm still working on myself, but if we can hit all the scores, uh, by Friday, that would be great. I still have like five to go. I'm not done yet either. So yeah, I am end of, the, end of the day tomorrow uh, or Saturday. That's fine. I'll, I'll probably take a look at it on Monday. If I, if I get the energy, I'll look at it on Sunday. I'm just, I don't have the energy that Karen Roney has. I wish I did. <laughs> uh, it's not energy. It's something else. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it would be super desirable. Like Friday is manana. Um, but, but for sure by the end of the weekend. So, you know, so we can work it on Monday because we do need to be setting our, what's our, we talked about even yeah. meeting later on, like meeting on the 17th. So that's, that's kind of number, number six. But. Am I the only laggard who hasn't finished his evaluations? Okay. All right. All right, thank you all for your company, uh, but we'll, we'll try to we'll try to push together as a group and get these things done. Uh, I think if we can get them done uh, end of day Saturday, that's a really good target because that is two days after our due date. And I, I'd like to say I'm just finishing mine up but it might be more accurate to say I'm just starting them up. So uh, we'll, we'll see, but we'll, we'll get it done. Thank you for the reminder. You know, we, we realize it, it's a lot of work and um, 
So people have lives. It, it takes a long time to go through all this. So we, we deeply appreciate all of the effort that it's requiring, all the time that it's requiring. requiring. And so um, just, you know, try to get to the finish line as, as, as quickly yeah. as feasible. Okay. But we realize it's a big ask. So. And, and Graham, I, I applaud your discipline. It sounds like you did get yours done on time. Congratulations. Before, before the deadline. You're, you're <laughs> my model. I, I bow to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, sounds like we're good on that set meeting date for funding deliberations. What day was that? I got I got here late. What day is we doing that? We we don't know yet. We're the uh, agenda item is to set it now. Okay. So it would what? seem like um, I think we tentatively talked about this. You know, next next week we can't make it too early because we won't have everything ready. So I think. Um, Sorry, we had thrown out the option of maybe next Thursday. We get into the next week and we're, we're starting to get into the holiday week that I bet you not, even though we can't go anywhere and do anything, um, I'm just betting that's not gonna be a real desirable um, you know, time. So, so if, we don't, if we don't really work on this, you know, later on next week, then we're probably looking at after the first of the year. Yeah, but isn't that too late? It's not too late, but, but, you know, with Anne off the board and knowing it, it, I, it would be difficult for a new so board. I think the thing is, can, can we, how many folks could make a meeting a week from today, next Thursday night? I see a no. Miss Madeline is a no. Another no. Two no. I have another board meeting. Mm. At, at night? So do I. Yeah. So let, let's talk real quick about what we're going to do in the funding deliberation discussion. This is, I'm, I'm working meeting. off of a poor memory. This, no. this is... Go ahead. Karen. Yeah. So, I mean, so what, what will happen is that we're going to, we, Eliberto is, is going to run the numbers, right? So he's going to plug in all the, all your scores. You have to do the, you know, apply the, um, the weights that we've, we just identified in option two and, and you all will receive a spreadsheet um, that says, here's, Here's basically what we are, you know, what, what we are recommending based on the scores. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and then we work it from there. So, you know, actually it, it doesn't take, to, well, anyhow, so that's, so we're coming with, here's, here's the matrix and here's how the scores came out based on how everyone yeah. managed them. So. And do we have to do any fine tuning or are we Might good have with to do it? Fine tuning. Yeah. You know, uh, so would, so the other thing, you know, would there be desire if, if, um, cause I think we really would love to pick a time where everyone could be there. Um, you, you know, Monday, the 21st, mm -hmm. how, how is that as a option? That, that works for me. I, I, yeah. I'm wide open. Can we do it early? So how early is early? Like some folks are like working. I don't know how they can get off. Oh, okay. I was thinking around 11 or. Probably. Um, probably not that early. Or the 22nd, 22nd actually would be way better. But yeah, either early on the 21st or early on the 22nd, I can do either of those. I know about everybody else. So Karen, I, I think it's gonna be very difficult to get all of us on the same day. 
Um, but maybe Nicole could send out a doodle and with the, the Thursday, the 17th, the 21st or the 22nd, and we just pick the day that most of us can be there. You're on mute. The most popular phrase of 2020. What's you're that? on mute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so how how early? I mean, I, I don't think eleven. I mean, I mean, so if we were to try to to you know meet later in the afternoon, like start at four or five, does that make it any better or more desirable? Who? So let's. Or is that possible? Thing went wrong. For how long, Karen? If we started, let's say, if we did it starting at four, how how long would we need? Forever. To go? Okay. So you know, I would say <laughs> with 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 how we've been doing that, and we had the scores already there. It it doesn't take mm -hmm. you know a two hour block of time is 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 seems adequate. Yeah, and we typically we would probably. We could reserve two hours, but I, I honestly think unless, unless we hit that hypothetical. I was the, at the outset, it, you know, I think two hours would be max probably, you know, we wanted. Yeah, to but we'd probably be done max. before that. Yeah, I would say we'd be done yeah. before that, but yeah, I think two hours. Okay, so four to six on the 21st. So let, let's do a, let's said? do a quick straw poll. If you can do okay. four to six on the 21st, raise your hand. Okay, Caitlin's out, Graham's out, Anne's out. So if you can do five to seven on the 21st, raise your hand. Graham, what's your time frame? That's a, just a bad day for me, the 21st. The 21st in general. Oh. Yeah. Same time period on the 22nd, four to six. If you can do four to six on the 22nd, raise your hand. Do you guys need me to attend that? Do we need I'd to love vote? For you too. I'd love Are, for Ann to attend. Oh, Karen right. can't either. Can you attend like from five to seven, Karen? Karen. No? Well, I could. I, yeah. I can switch somebody in my son's appointment. I can do it. Oh, oh well, you know, I'm just, I'm just asking. So I don't want to. Okay, so five to seven gram you can do, four to six you can do on the 22nd. It looks like most people can do four to six on the 22nd. Yeah. Uh, Karen Phillips cannot. Well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I can try to switch something around. I'll, I'll work on it. Do we need to vote on that day? We'll need a quorum, yeah. To, okay. uh, because what will be happening is we're gonna be, those are the recommendations that we're giving to council. I see. Okay. We're at that point. Got it. Yeah. We're at that um, point. Let's, let's shoot for, uh, if, if you can do four to six Graham and Caitlin four to six works. Okay. On the 22nd, Let, let's shoot for that. I think it'll be good to get it over a little earlier. Um, maybe we'll all have a, well, maybe I'll have a little more energy and, um, Karen and if, Phillips. Yeah, if, I'll, I'll try to get my uh, son's appointment moved. I think I can. Okay, and if you can't, it's uh, it's very understandable. So please don't create stress over it. No problem. Okay. So Karen and Eliberto, are we good? Yeah. Once I get all the scores, I will start putting stuff in, and and by the twenty second, I I. Uh, I will have something more before to show you. Awesome. Well, you'll have mine by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, and if you don't, it's probably because it went to your junk email, you know, junk box and email. Um, spam. <laughs> exactly, the spam folder. Okay, uh, I lost my- It's agenda. other business and adjourn. Is there any other business for this evening? No? In that case, uh, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn. 
I move to adjourn. Second. Always so many motion, always so many hands shoot up when it's the motion to adjourn. Never a laggard in the group. Uh, then we are adjourned and uh, it is 8.30. So we've got an extra half an hour. I hope you make use of it to have the most joyful half an hour you've <laughs> had this entire week. Yay! Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Yeah.